Ruiz. Funkateers, Bootsy here to bring the Truth and Rhythm family's attention to Funk Not Fight. Yeah, this is a call to action. We spread hope, not hate, uh, to gain satisfaction throughout our communities via the music uplifting unity. Uh, Peppermint Patty, tell us a little more. Thinker is our partner. Thinker music, that is. So please check the link that's scrolling across the bottom, click it, and submit your music. Let's all funk, funk not, not fight. fight. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. Brought to you by funkinstuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. G.X. Goldfine, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, truth seekers, and truth crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise, and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I'm pleased to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership producer, singer, songwriter, and multi-instrumentalist Chucky Booker. In addition to a pair of successful solo albums through the years, he has worked with dozens of big-name acts, including Ray Parker Jr., Barry White, Gerald Albright, Vanessa Williams, The Whispers, Melba Moore, Layla Hathaway, Ray Charles, Callaway, Lionel Richie, Angela Winbush, Stevie Wonder, Diana Ross in Vogue, Rihanna, Bette Midler, and Philip Bailey. In addition, he was a member of the 1980s funk band Tees and served as musical director for Janet Jackson's Rhythm Nation World Tour. Chucky, thank you for joining the show. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great, man. It's good to see you, man, and really appreciate what you're doing here, man. I think it's awesome, man. I'm, I totally love it, man. Ah, uh, well, thank you. I'm flattered and uh, been wanting you on for a long time, so it's high time you're here. Yeah, I'm happy to be here, man, for real. Yeah, so, and where do I find you today? Right now, I am in the wonderful city of Las Vegas. All right, yeah. Yes. So are, are you on a winning streak? <laughs> no, no gambling for me, man. <laughs> no gambling for me, none whatsoever. Yeah, I think that's the only way you can live there, you know, is if you're not into that, then you're okay. Yeah, absolutely, for real. <laughs> Very cool. Well, you know, I've had a lot of your uh, friends and colleagues on the show, uh, you know, Ollie Brown and Kipper and uh, Court, uh, Courtney and uh, just so many on and on. So 
Yeah, yeah. it's great to have you to fill in some of the blanks. Sure. I would love to, man. Yeah. yeah. Whatever whatever blanks there are, I'd be happy to fill in as, as best as I can, you know. All right. All right. I'm going to hold you to that. So let's uh, rewind a little bit. And, okay. uh, you know, uh, you came up in Los Angeles. I'm also a native uh, from L.A. So um, nice. Yeah. Uh, Santa Monica High School for me. I don't know if you knew that about me, but yeah. I know that. That's that's wow. OK, that's cool. Yeah. Not too far away. Yeah. Yeah. So I know you ran in, you know, those circles with a lot of those guys that came up in that part of the uh, city. And yeah. uh, as far as music goes, so, but what steered you to music? Why did you take that path? Uh, I basically took that path only because my entire family is musically inclined. They're every person in my family uh, has some type of musical ability uh, from my dad, uh, my mother, uh, my, my dad was a singer. You know, he had a group, uh, the Blue Jays back in the, you know, 60s. And it was a doo-wop group. And he had a great voice, man. Man, killer voice. Uh, and my mother was a gospel pianist. Uh, she sang, played writer, producer. Um, she did everything, you know. So I think it was just only a matter of time that once I came around, you know, that I was going to be involved into music. Uh, and that came at an early age when I was five years old. Uh, you know, my mother played for a, a local church in L.A. And she had me learn this song called Witness for My Lord. And I sung it at five years old, uh, went up to the front of the church and I sung it. And after that, she asked me, well, how do you feel? You know, were you nervous? I'm like, no. She's like, so I'm sure in the inside she was like, yeah, you got one, you know. Got me a little musician or singer or whatnot. But from that point, it, you know, it just uh, just escalated from that point on. You know, my grandmother was a gospel pianist and a singer. My uncle, Darnell White, is a jazz flautist. Uh, so it was just like I said, I grew up around music my entire life. So I really had no choice, you know, from that point on. So and what was your first instrument that you gravitated toward? The first instrument I uh, gravitated was actually the piano. You know, I, I started tinkering on the piano when I was like two or three. You know, my mother would show me stuff. Uh, but it really wasn't my, my favorite instrument. My favorite instrument was actually the bass guitar. Um, but like I said, growing up in my early teens, you know, I played drums in church, in my mother's church, in my, gr my grandmother's church. But yeah, the piano, I would say, was the first thing I really connected with, but it wasn't my favorite. It was a bass guitar. It was actually my favorite instrument. And who were some of your, your big heroes musically? Wow. Musically? Growing up? Yeah. that is. Whew. I would have to say my very first musical influence was Bootsy Collins. That was my guy, man. Bootsy was, you know... That was like the first guy that just really hit me hard. I think, you know, I've had other kind of like, you know, like DJ Rogers was a very big influence on me. Uh, my godfather, Barry White, was a huge influence on me. But to really just hit me hard, like as a just an overall all around influence, it was Bootsy Collins that really I, I connected with, you know, as a kid, you know, because he had this kind of cartoon kind of you know atmosphere just you know larger than life you know that that and he was a bass player on top of it so i think he kind of was like a huge influence in my earlier earlier upbringing but then after that it was definitely barry white barry white dj rogers uh you know later on prince you know those guys you know but yeah i'd have to say bootsy was my first big influence did you ever get to see him in concert back then? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did. As a matter of fact, on his, I think on the second album, uh, all the, well, not, no, all the name is Bootsy was his, was his first album, but the second album, the one, the Bootzilla album, uh, my uh, uncle Darnell took me to Aaron's Records in L.A. Where oh, he, Melrose. Yeah, Melrose, yeah. yeah. He had like this big, you know, he had this big thing, man, where, you know, come meet Bootsy Collins, you know, and 
I told my uncle, I said, hey, you got to take me to Aaron's Records, man. I have to go, man. I, I just, I got to see him in person. So he took me there and he made an appearance and I saw him. And the moment I seen him, man, it was like, okay, I, I got to be like this, this musician. I got to be a musician, man, because it, it was just the atmosphere, the aura was just incredible. You know, it was incredible. And I did see him in concert, of course. You know, I went to all the funk festival and all that stuff, you know. So, yeah, but I, I seen him, man, and it, he, just, he just blew me away. Yeah, I think probably the same year. I missed him at Aaron's, but I did see the uh, show he did at the Forum in 1978. That was just incredible. Yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a monster Bootzilla show, you know. the monster yeah, but... yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. I used, to, I used to run around the house, man, with a... With her. my mom would give me these clothes pins. I'd have a cape on the back, and I she had these platform shoes. I would put on like a wig, and I drew these star glasses. And I'm going around the house, going "Hallelujah!" <laughs> What's going on, brother? You know, I was doing all of that stuff, man. You know, <laughs> just wanted to be Bootsy. <laughs> awesome, I love it, man. Um, yeah, Aaron's Records. I forgot about that. It's, you know, they yeah, kind of shut man. it down some years ago, but uh, oh, yeah. that was, yeah. you know, one of the best. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, so what was uh, like the first real band that you got into, I'm assuming in high school or something like that? Yeah. First band I got into, uh, yeah, it was like, uh, I think I was in the seventh grade, eighth grade. We had a, me and my friends, we put together a band called Something Special. And it was like, it was a big group starting at first. We had like a horn section and, you know, we had the full on rhythm section. It was like probably like nine, eight or nine, you know, people in the band, musicians in the band. Uh, we started doing, you know, just local top 40 around in, in L.A. and San Pedro and Long Beach. And, you know, we did that for a while. So, yeah, that was like my first band was like a band called Something Special. And then uh, we ended up, doing this uh we did a, a talent show it was like a talent show slash uh model show and it was in i can't i think it was it was either in gardena or in la somewhere i can't remember and that was my first connection like we had a band and then this other band came on and this other band they came on they were called seventh heaven and i'm just like man these dudes it was like Derek Organ on drums, Cornelius Mims on bass, Tommy Organ on guitar, Rex Alice on keys. And I had never seen like another band that was just as funky as the band I was in. But these dudes were just just killing. Yeah. And that's how I met all the guys. They later on became T's. But that's how I met those guys, you know, during that that era. So it was, it was really, really cool, man. Really cool. Yeah. So before they got signed, were they, you know, kicking butt even then? Yeah, they were killing, you know, everybody in like the South Bay, L.A. area, they all knew about like Seventh Heaven and, and you know, there was a couple other groups out there that were kind of kicking butt, you know. It was a, I remember there was a group called Modulation that was pretty cool, you know, they, you know, but uh, but it was Seventh Heaven, man. Those dudes were just, they were just like the local heroes, you know, musical heroes, by then the band that i was in we were more or less more south like near san pedro in that area so we really didn't get out to the la area too much but we all knew you know who those guys were that were like you know some of those guys that were from gardena and you know compton and you know carson so you know that's that whole south bay area was just like a big plethora of musicians you know at that time so we kind of knew all about each other but we never really connected you know and so viewers know, I think we're talking, what, about 1981? Like, no, it's more like 1980. Yeah, okay. like 79, 80. Yeah. Yeah, so funk was at its peak and about to start to really change once the 80s came on. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for real. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. So did you feel comfortable performing in front of people? Oh, yeah, yeah. No issues whatsoever, you know, no issues whatsoever. I, I love it, as a matter of fact. I, I enjoy it. Uh, it's not one of my, you know, I guess 
if I had to, if I had a choice between production and being in the studio and performing, yeah, I would probably take, you know, just production and, and working in the studio. Cause I just love that. You know, I, I just love that vibe, you know, but I mean, I, I have no quarrels or no, you know, uh, I don't have any issues with, you know, playing live or performing live, none whatsoever. And what is the uh, Barry White connection being your godfather? My uh, Barry White, to me, I think that was, I would say 1973. This was like right at the beginning of the pinnacle of his career. Uh, his, his wife, Glodine White, and my mother, Celestine, they, they have been best friends since they were seven years old. And even till this day, they're still like, you know, the best of friends. Uh, so when Glodine had her group, you know, she had a group, uh, which wasn't Love Unlimited at the time, but they had their, their trio, their group. When my godmother met Barry, uh, Glodine had told Barry about, she said, hey, you know, my best friend, her, her son, he's, uh, you know, he's, I was like 10 years old. He said, but, you know, he's a musician and I think, you know, give him some kind of, uh, you know, encouragement, you know, to, to continue in music. And so one day <clears throat> he came down to the hood in San Pedro. Like, I mean, he pulled up in a, a Continental Mark IV, a white one with skirts on the side. So all my friends were outside playing. I'll never forget this. So a couple of my friends ran up. My, friend Lisa wrote him she knocked on my door she said hey I'm like what she goes Barry White is parking his car outside I'm like what she's like yes he's and he's walking up the stairs you had to like walk up these stairs to get to the apartment complex where I live so I'm like are you sure and she's like dude he's he's walking up right now so I opened up the window and I'm looking through the window and I see this just this larger than life figure walking up towards the towards the door, and I'm like, Mom, I said, Barry White is outside. She goes, I know. She said, I, you know, I, I told Glodine or whatever, and, and, you know, they were going to come over and say hello. And he, I just remember he walked through the door, and he just looked at me, and he was like this massive, he's like 6'4", just this massive figure, you know, and I'm looking at him, and he just says, how you doing, you know, how you doing, Chuck? you know, and this deep voice, and I'm just like mesmerized, you know. <laughs> and he goes, uh, he said, your, your mother and Glody tell me that, you know, you're a musician. You like to play? I said, yeah, I do. And my mother had like this little piano on the side, you know, of the house. He said, oh, why don't you play something for me? I said, okay. So I went over, I played and he asked me to play something else. And yeah, that was the, the beginning of it. From that point on, I he used to, you know, he used to let me come over, you know, in the summer. I used to hang out in the summer and you know, just hang out with him and his kids and used to watch him in the studio. And, oh, man, that was like, that was huge for me, you know, as a kid. Super huge. Because I learned a lot about, you know, production and writing and, you know, working with other musicians and working with other artists. You know, I learned all that from watching him deal with other people. So as, as a kid, that really served its purpose for me later on in my career, you know, knowing how to be a musical director and how to deal with people and how to deal with musicians. And yeah, it was, uh, it was an incredible uh, experience for me. Wow. What a great advantage, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, so what was your first professional quote unquote, like break, would you say? Wow. I would say my first professional break came in uh, wow I would have to say around 1980 81 81 uh, uh, again there was a lot of a lot of uh, huge musicians at that time working in the LA area and I had a friend of uh, uh, Gary Taylor. Gary Taylor was working on an album project that he was on at AM Records. And I guess a friend of his, Craig Raglan, who was also a bass player, 
I guess he had asked Craig, hey, man, do you know any, any uh, uh, bass, synth bass players or bass players or synth keyboard players that can come in and do a session for me? And Craig said, hey, man, I know this kid. It's Chucky, man. You should give him a shot. It's, you know, he's this guy, he's, he's into the funk. And Gary had a couple of funk records, so he had this song called Turn It Loose that was super funky, man. I mean, man, it was dope. Really super funky. So he says, hey, man, I need somebody to play mini mood bass on this track. So uh, he invited me up. It was in Hollywood. Went to the session. He played it down one time. He goes, now, if you need me to play it, like, you know, a few more times, I'm like, nope, I got it. It's Kia E, can't go wrong. It's funk, E minor, just run the track. So he ran it down one time, and I played synth. And I just remember Gary, Gary was just looking at me like, dude, what planet are you from? Like, <laughs> it was so funny. He's just looking at me, and he's like, how old are you? And, you know, but I was just so much into funk, man. And, and I mean, still, still am, but at that time, oh, man. And that's where I got my start. He started uh, having me do more sessions. And then my godfather had me do a lot of sessions, you know, and and it just kind of just took off from there, you know. But Gary Taylor was like my first initial start at doing like recording sessions. Wow. And what was the first track that you were part of that you heard on the radio? Oh, wow. I think that was a song. Uh, my godfather had a song called Show You Right that uh, that was, uh, I can't remember what year it was. I'd have to check. I can't remember offhand. But that was the first time I actually, like, heard my, you know, me playing on the record. You know, I was, like, on the radio. And that was, like, kind of cool. But it, during that same year, I also uh, worked with a group called Kiddo. They had a song called Action Speaks Louder Than Words that my bandmate Kipper Jones at the time wrote. And so uh, it was me, Kipper, and, and Rex Salas, I believe, who was the keyboard player at the time. Okay. Yeah, so I believe that was, uh, yeah, Kipper Jones, Rex Salas, and myself, uh, played on this song called action yeah. speaks louder than words on this kiddo project yeah so, kiddo I, kiddo i know well uh nm records and it was yeah Donnie some p-funk P -funk guys Danny sterling yeah yeah, so. yeah yeah so yeah so all during that time is like that's the first time i really heard my you know self on the radio you know as, as far as being a musician so that must have been a thrill it was cool it was cool it was super cool yeah, putting your chest out a little bit further maybe than before. Yeah, you know, <laughs> wow, you know it's like, okay, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm up with something right, you know. Yeah, so yeah. When I look at, at your uh, credits, you know, one of the first ones, I think the first one actually listed on this sheet I have is Ray Parker. Um, did, that, yeah. did, that, did that come before Tease or? Wow, you know what? I totally forgot about that. I, I forgot I played on Sex of the Single Man, which is Ray Parker. Yeah, I think they came right after the first Tease album. The first Tease album I didn't play on, but I was there at all the, 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 the I was there at all the, the sessions. Uh, they were recording up in American Studios uh, in North Hollywood. So I was there. I did play, but, you know, it's like Rex had me, you know, hanging out. I was kind of getting to know the guys because I had just pretty much met all the guys, you know, Corny and Kipper and Derek Oregon actually brought me in. But, uh, you know, I had a chance to get a feel for how they recorded and they did all of their stuff and uh, as far as recording. Uh, but I met Ray there, and I think I played, like, you know, when we weren't recording, you know, I was kind of messing around with the piano and stuff. And and Ray kind of, I guess he just, you know, dug the vibe or whatever. So when he recorded that Sex and the Single Man album, uh, he just called me and said, hey, man, come over and, you know, see what you got. You know, so, yeah, played on that. So it was cool. It was cool. Yeah, well, there's a guy who started really young, too, you know. Yes. 
Ray started more seriously early. Detroit man, it's Detroit guy. Yeah. He played on all of my Godfather's records. That dude is amazing, man. Ray is, is, is one amazing musician, man, by far. Yeah, and the Six Degrees of Separation thing, you know, radio opened for that Bootsy show I mentioned that I went to in 78. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> radio. Yeah. Uh, what was your impression of, uh, you know, like Kipper and, uh, and Cornelius and those guys when you first met them? When I first met them, man, I just, at that time, I just said, man, these guys are on a whole nother level, you know, and the band that uh, I was in at the time, I just felt like, I mean, they, they were a good band, great musicians, but after seeing those guys, I'm like, that's the level that I should be on because I felt like I was just a little bit further ahead than where I was at. And I said, this is where I need to be. And, and at that level, uh, corny, Great bass player, great keyboarder, synth bass player. Derek Oregon, a killer drummer. The, I mean, when I first saw the band, Derek was the one that really stood out to me more than everybody, you know, at that at that very instance, because his drum playing, you know, <clears throat> a lot of the guys emulated, you know, like what Prince was doing and, you know, and they had it, but then added some more to that. But at that point, I felt Derek was like the guy that had his own style. I mean, he had his, he had this hi-hat thing, man, going, yeah. man, that was just in his pocket and his playing and just his choice of feels. At that particular time, nobody was doing that. A lot of people were copying Derek Oregon. So Derek really took to me first, you know. And then from that point on, I heard, you know, I saw how him and Corny was locked in and then Thomas Oregon and Joe Parsons and and then, after all of that, the music, then you got like Kipper, and Kipper was just the consummate, you know, professional when it came to performing and, and his vocals, man, it was just, they were just like the ultimate funk band to me. So when I had the chance to like kind of hang out with them and play with them, it, it was like, okay, cool. You know, this is what, this is what it's all about, you know, and this is where I, I need to be in that, in that realm. And so in the early 80s, I'm guessing, uh, Chucky, that you were seeing like the Prince shows, the Rick James shows, the Roger Cotton shows. Absolutely. Yeah. Of course. I saw all of that, man. I saw, uh, yeah, Prince, Rick, Rick James. I'm, I was, I'm a big Rick James fan. I'm a big Prince fan. Uh, yeah, I saw all of that stuff, you know. I remember seeing a lot of them at the Long Beach Arena, actually. Oh, yeah. Saw yeah. that, yes. Yeah. I went to all the concerts. The one, in, uh, well, in eighty in eighty one, I saw Prince in Santa Monica, the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium. I was there, dude. I was there too. I was there, man. <laughs> I was there. You know what? I, I still tell people to this day that, about on Dirty Mind. I think it was. I mean, on uh, Head when he did yeah. the keyboard and guitar at the same time. Oh yeah, yeah, Whoa. yeah. He that dude was amazing, man. Yeah, I was at that concert, man. In fact, I was like. My mom couldn't take, she couldn't take me to that concert. So I had to take the bus, dude. I took the <laughs> bus to go see that concert. You know, I was like, I got to go see this guy. Went by myself, <laughs> you know. And yeah, I, I, I just sunk it all in, man. Big time. You know, what was really cool about that for me was I was at the a Coliseum Rolling Stones show where he got booed off the stage. Yeah. And then that Santa Monica Civic was his first time back after yeah. that. And so yep. I felt like he came to reclaim what was his, you know? Yeah. I was just saying that, that uh, Prince show was uh, something oh. civic and um, yeah. I saw him so many times play out there. It was uh, unbelievable. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, but there were so many great shows at that, you know, era back then in LA, sure you know? So there was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Commodores. I was, uh, went to the Long Beach Arena. I saw them there. Yeah, it was kind of cool. Oh now, yeah, I, ha I have down here for you, Chucky, a credit for an act called Copper. Yes. Yeah, tell me a little bit about that. Yes, Copper. Yeah, I wow. You know, after I kind of did my stint with T's, and I was working, you know, with my God godfather he kind of went on and did his his thing i kind of left to kind of do things on my own you know i kind of wanted to 
try to do things on my own merit at that time. Um, so I ended up joining a production company in San Fernando Valley um, called Jam Power Records, where I really fine tuned a lot of my production there. I've worked with many, many, many artists and kind of just fine tuned my, um, I guess my musicianship. Uh, and Copper was part of that Jam Power Records roster. Uh, they had a lot of artists there, but um, she was one that I worked with. And it, um, it was cool. She got some really cool radio airplay you know, back then in L.A., the first record that I ever did with her that really did something, uh, I did a song called Second to None. And it was on Power, you know, 106 at the time. And it, it became like a, you know, kind of a semi semi hit in L.A. So that really got, a you know, a lot of pull for me during that time. But Copper was a cool, cool female, you know, kind of artist that to work with at that time. And she was very. Uh, open to do you know different things and she was really cool to work with her, so that really uh helped me a lot now did you feel like the label uh fumbled tease a little bit i mean that or you know why, why did you part ways with tease you know uh i think for me at that time again i I'm, i've always considered myself a team player um uh, and with the whole tease thing uh it was cool because those are my guys, but there was always this tug and pull in the group, uh, especially uh, at that time with uh, Kipper and Cornelius, you know, and that really hurt me because, you know, those are my, those are my guys, you know, and I love both, but, you know, the whole creative thing, you know, I, I always considered Kipper as like was the leader of the group, you know, as, as, as far as a whole. But when it came to like the musical uh, perspective of it, I really, um, really, really uh, respected where Corny was coming from. Um, so there was always this tug and pull, you know, from my from my perspective, you know, from the outside looking in. You know, I was part of all that. You know, I, I experienced it. I seen it. Uh, so there's a lot of tug and pull and a lot of creative differences that I didn't really so much that I dug. But, hey, I'm a team player, so you're my guys. I'm going to roll with you. You know, I'm going to just be quiet and sit in the back and just whatever you guys want to do, I'm cool with. But, you know, I didn't really have a lot of say-so, you know, in that, in that area. Uh, like I said, I just wanted to just play. And there was a time when we did talk about me being a part of group of, of T's as an actual big part of the group, but I never signed with them. I was never signed with teeth i was just mainly a hired gun but you know everyone always uh, looked at me as being a part of tees and yeah i was but just not contractually you know i was just you know and i never really signed with them because at that time i was still signed to my godfather with unlimited gold records so i technically could not sign with them but even if i did i i don't think i never would have signed with them because it just was not um it was just it wasn't in, it wasn't just the right i guess position for me at that time because i wanted to you know i wanted to like push myself as a as a producer and as a writer and as a musician but i still wanted to help them you know and be a part of them because you know they helped me i helped them you know we were it was always a collective with tees but at the time when i left i just said you know i got to go out and do my thing because, um, you know, it was all, I mean, if I recall, there were just times where, you know, it's like right when we were on the edge of doing something and then it was like, oh, well, Courtney's going to go play with, you know, this artist. I'm like, dang, you know, or right when stuff was about to happen, then, you know, one of the other guys went to go do another gig. And it just, we just, just could not, you know, put it together. Um, and I think at that time, to a lot of people looked at T's as like, oh, they're just a, a time clone. You know, we, we really didn't have uh, a, a true identity as far as outside of what T's was doing. They just looked at T's as a time clone because, you know, they had the suits, ties. The only thing difference was, you know, we wore sneakers, you know. Uh, so it just, 
I think everyone in the band kind of had their way of how they would like to do things. And because of that, I didn't push the issue. I didn't like say, hey, guys, why don't we just do this? Because, of course, I wasn't signed. So I just kind of stood back and just let it all fall into place. But then it got to a point where I just said, you know what? I got to do my own thing. You know, love those guys dearly, you know, but uh, it just it just got to a point where it just didn't work, you know, for me. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. The, the group had friction like the time did also. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. and it's not to say, you know, all groups, you know, there's always going to be friction. You know, that's just a part of being in a band. You know, it's not like it's nothing terrible happened. It was just, that's what you would expect, you know, like, you know, me and Corny bumped heads on a lot of things, you know, because, you know, he's a bass player and he's a keyboard player. You know, I'm a keyboard player. I'm a bass player. So we all have these looks of, of how we should do things, you know, but, you know, we, we, bumped heads earlier you know but still i tried to include him in as much of of the things that i did on the outside even when like i got the janet jackson thing you know uh when i got the gig as as musical director for janet jackson you know we all rehearsed together you know we all went in as a collective to say hey this is what i'm presenting to janet you know and but what some of those guys fail to realize is that at the end of the day, it, I mean, I put the band together, but at the end of the day, I'm not the artist. I'm not the one that says who's going to pick the people to say, hey, uh, I'm going to take this whole entire group or I'm going to take this person, I'm going to take that person. You know, and that's where me and Corny, after finding out after so many years that, you know, that he held that in, like I had something to do with that you know, with him not being a part of that Rhythm Nation thing. And I wasn't. It was just that at the end of the day, when, you know, Janet calls me up and says, okay, I like this, but I like this guy over here. It's like, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? Tell her, say, no, I don't want him. I want the other guy. It's her man. She made that decision. You know, I even have, um, I even have like some collect uh, clips where she talks about that, you know, where Donnie Simpson asked her about, you know, um, hiring the band. She said, yeah. She said, majority of the guys are Chucky's band. But she said, two of the guys are not. And those two guys were Derek Allen, DOA Allen, the bass player, and David Berry, her guitar player. And those are the two guys that she picked. So it just so happens that Derek Allen is a friend of mine. He's a very good friend of mine. He's my best to He's my best friend to this day right now. But back then, it was like all musicians, you know everybody. It was a cattle call. It was like a crazy cattle call. And it just so happens that was the guy that Janet picked. So either way, I wouldn't have went wrong. Whether If she would have picked Cornelius, it wouldn't have been wrong. But on the other end, it wouldn't have been wrong either. You know, it's, that's what it was. You know, she... I think she picked Derek, not just because of his playing ability, but also she has to look at it from the standpoint of, is this guy going to, how is he going to move on stage? You know, it's, there's so many facets involved in picking a musician, especially someone like Janet Jackson, who is a, uh, you know, she's, she's, a, she's image driven. So she wants to make sure that, hey, whoever I pick, it's not going to be just about the music too. It's got to, there's other intangibles involved. And I think that's where I think Corny failed to realize that as well. You have to tie all that in. But I think a lot of people went probably went back and forth and said, oh, you know, it's Chucky's man. And yeah, Chucky, you know, he, no, that was all on Janet and that was all on Jimmy and Terry, you know, and to be honest with you, Tommy Organ, the bait, the, the guitar player, Tommy was not picked for that for that uh, Rhythm Nation band. And that hurt me because, you know, Tommy's my dude. And what happened was, you know, because, again, Janet had another guitar player. She had two guitar players that she started off with, uh, David Berry and Basil Fung. So it was like she had her band. So what I was going to do was, hey, I'm going to just eat, 
eat it. I'm going to see if I can just take Tommy with me and, and, you know, pay for his, you know, salary and, you know, I'll do all that. My manager was like, yo, that's crazy to do that. But that's how dedicated I was trying to keep every, everybody together. However, you know, when it came down again, Tommy didn't make it until Jimmy and Terry came to the, one of the rehearsals and we did the set with the other guys. And so we stopped. Jimmy pulls me over. Jimmy Jam pulls me over to the side and he goes, sounded good, man. He says, except I have one question. And I said, okay. I said, what is it? He goes, why is it Tommy in the band? And I was like, well, you know, and you know, I have to be a uh, diplomatic about it. I didn't want to say, hey, you know, your girl, you know, I didn't want to, you know, because it, it's her call. It's not my call. It's her call, you know. So it was like, well, I said, you know, Jimmy, he goes, don't worry about it. He says, I'll take care of it. So they went up to the top. I guess he talked to Janet and he came back down and, you know, they made the decision and. You know, Tommy was in, you know, and again, this goes to I could have done the same thing with Corny. However, you know, this is I'm the musical director. What is it going to look like for me to go to her to say, hey, I, you know, I'm not going to do this gig unless Corny's in. You know, that's crazy. I'm not going to do that. So, you know, it's just about being professional and understanding that you can't get every gig, you know, that that you try out for and i told all the guys that you know yeah we're going to go in as a collective but all of us may not get paid it's just that janet felt that Derek doa allen was the best fit for her job period that's it i had nothing to do with that she felt that i didn't make that call it's her band her name is on the marquee so for the last time you know it's like i hate having to to, you know, people always come to me, hey, man, what happened with your corny? I'm like, dude, I had nothing to do with that. That's Janet's call. So at the end of the day, she made the call, and it actually turned out to be, you know, the correct choice because it it was very successful, and it worked out for her. She is the main artist. She dug it. She enjoyed it. So, hey, my job is done here. You know, I can, I can only do so much, you know. Period. That's that's it. End of the yeah. story. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's it. Well, I appreciate you explaining that, Chucky, for sure. And yeah. Uh how how did um you come to to get in that role? Did she dig your first record or what happened? Yeah, well, we had a mutual friend. Uh we met way early back in the Jam Power days. She had a a, a good friend named Melody Andrews who worked at Jam Power Records when I was there. Her and M Melody and Janet were like best of friends. They were good friends. Melody co-wrote "Let's Wait a While" with her on that on her uh, album that Jimmy and Terry produced. And I met her there uh, with with Melody. She uh, Janet came by the studio. I think she was like fourteen or fifteen at the time, which is crazy. But uh, I met her there, and we you know we just hit it off. You know, she was cool. We were cool. Uh, she knew some of my ability, you know, things that I did, but I, I don't think she really knew until I think it was Jimmy and Terry that told her, like, hey, this is the guy you need for this tour. You know, we can't do it, so you need to get Chucky. So, and it, she was like, wow, you know, I know Chucky. You know, and he's like, he, but he's, is he like that? You know, so... You know, and so we just hit it off. She invited me to the Rhythm Nation party at the time, and, and I went, and she asked me and uh, if I would be musical director. And I was like, yeah, because that's right down my alley, that type of music at that time, that genre, you know, and, and plus I'm a big fan of Jimmy and Terry anyway. You know, those are like, you know, some of my idols, most of my idols, you know, the guys that I look up to. Uh, so... It was just like, it was a no-brainer for me to do that because I could do that genre of music with my eyes closed. So it worked out, you know. Um, of course, there's a lot of speculation, like, who really put that show together, you know. Co contrary to other musical directors out there, no. I put that show together, and I would dare challenge anybody to tell me 
any different, you know, because I did. I put that entire show together. And, uh, you know, it's, it speaks for itself, you know. I hate that I have to say things like that, but it's just sometimes, in the great words of Janet's um, brother, sometimes when people get in a position where there's fame and fortune involved, man, human nature takes over and people just say crazy things, man. And it's, and, and you never get credit for it. So the only way I'm going to get credit for it is to let people know that, no, I did that. I put that show together. Nobody else. I did that. So, you know, and I really dare anybody to tell me otherwise, but they're not because they know, mm -hmm. you know, know who did it. So we'll just leave it at that. Was there anything that uh, happened on that tour in particular that was sort of like the high of the highs for you? Uh, you know what? Just being on stage with Janet, you know, just being on stage with Janet and, and knowing that she is embarking on a uh, road to history, you know, music history, that that tour still is one of the biggest, you know, uh, intro tours to any artist ever you know that that tour was like the biggest tour ever and just to know to be a part of that uh every show was just amazing every show was just kicking ass everybody was on it we were all focused we were all in in detail uh we knew you know we knew what the assignment was and that assignment was that every night when you go on that stage you kick ass, period. And everybody was all on one accord. And, and to me, that was the highlight of that tour because we weren't taking no prisoners. Anybody could have came either before us or after this, after that, but it wasn't going to happen. I was, wasn't going to happen. Was there a glitch that happened anywhere? There was one glitch that did happen. It was the very first show. I'll never forget that. Uh, we were in Miami, and uh, yeah, we were in Miami, and it was the first show ever for this Rhythm Nation tour. And I remember Whitney Houston was in the audience, and we had a glitch because we, at that time, we were running, uh, wow, what was that? Um, can't think of the name of this thing that we were using at that time, but it was Mike, it was her brother's. It wasn't a public sign. It was, uh, God, what was the name of this? It's, it's not crossing my mind. But we were basically running just sound effects and background vocals. And we that's what we were running, sound effects. But everything else musically, that was all being played by the band. Again, there were other entities out there saying, oh, but all this stuff was on recorded. Nope. Nope. It was only the sound effects, the explosions, and some background vocals. But everything else, we were all playing that live, straight up live. No, 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 no music was on tape. None whatsoever. Even the samples, like Rhythm Nation, all that crazy down, go, check it out, down, go, check it out. I took that sample and I just broke it down, cut, chopped it up. Tim Bali, who was our percussionist, he had all of those samples on on our uh, on pads. So when we played it, he played it live. He was gang, gang, check it too. Uh, 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 uh. I mean, live. But there were some people out there that said, oh, it was uh, I'm not gonna call anybody out. I could, but I'm not. But yeah, we uh it was all live. Every song was live as far as musically. Uh, but this thing went out right in the middle of nasty. And it turned around, and we know what? We just said, ah, oh, shoot. So when, it, when the actual glitch happened, I just told Byron, who was the guy who was running this machine, I said, hey, I said, just leave it off. So for the rest of the, the song, it was killing. And nobody really knew. They were like, yo, man, were y'all playing that live? I said, yeah. And, you know, and the thing was, Janet was singing live. So it was, you know, it was like, it just, we didn't have, like I said, the certain backgrounds and, and some of the, uh, the explosion and effects and all that stuff that was actually recorded. But everything else was live. So wow. it yeah. happened, you know. Yeah.
Just that one time, though. Everything else is was smooth sailing. So, you know, that that tour came between your first and second records, right? So the, it, I yes. felt like when I looked at things that yes. in a way it sort of put like your second record maybe on hold kind of because you were busy with that project. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I um, Well, at the time, I was also working with a group named Troop that I was working with right in the middle of that on their next album. So it kind of slowed things up, but I made it an effort to just really focus on Janet because I wanted that. I knew that was going to be a part of history. So I didn't want to cut any corners and try to make it, you know, uh, you know, this will work. No, I even sacrificed my own because I was the opening act as well for that tour. So I even sacrificed my own show. I, we only had a day and a half of rehearsals, you know, up until the kickoff of the tour. It was a day and a half. That's all I had to put my entire 35 minutes set together, a day and a half. And I did it because I was so involved in making sure that Janet's show was the best it could be. You know, I, I really put the effort in. And to me, I'm very proud of that because it did show, you know, in the work. Um, I'm not saying that the rest of her tours, I'm not saying that, you know, they weren't as successful because they were successful. She's had amazing, great bands. But I'm just saying to myself, that first tour was really pinnacle, you know, for her to be successful, to have other great tours after that. I wanted to be the catalyst to make sure that whoever comes after me, you know, make sure that it's on point because this is this is what started it. So I wanted to make sure that Janet had, you know, that that type of, um, I guess, aura or entity coming after that Rhythm Nation tour. And that thing went on for what, like eight months or how long was it? It was like eight months. Yeah. She did go after that, um, you know, because we, we did the the one, I think it was the fall tour. And then in 90, we kicked off like a summer tour. And then after that, she went to Europe, but I didn't go to Europe because I had, um, you know, I had a commitment to finish my record and get out of, for that time it was my nice and wild album. So I had to make sure that that was, uh, that, you know, I met, you know, that quota for that, you know, so that's what happened. Well, you know, it's uh, been a long time ago, but still, you know, congratulations on that accomplishment, man. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.